Yeah, hi. Uh, so this session was to talk about uh, atomic rights and buffered I.O. And my idea originally was in the last session to try to give a primer or a refresher on our torn right protection or atomic rights. Uh, I didn't get a chance to do that, so I'll just uh, quickly go through it for anyone who's not familiar, and then we can discuss the more, uh, let's say, uh, undecided topics of uh, torn right protection. So, yeah, as I said, I'm just going to give a primer on the torn right protection that uh, we're currently proposing for the kernel. So, uh, the question is, uh, first, uh, the purpose of uh, torn right protection, uh, generally to increase uh, database I.O. performance and increase disk lifespan. Uh, so, databases generally use a uh, fixed-sized page, generally something like 8 or 10K. 16K is the special, uh, who's, which is generally larger than the implicit power sale uh, automaticity, oh, automaticity of the storage device. And uh, databases use a uh, method called a double write buffer file to log data before uh, committing it to the data tables. Uh, so generally do this uh, in case of power fail that uh, the data can be restored and we don't get any fractured uh, pages uh, committed to the storage. Uh, so the turn right protection that we're proposing uh, removes the need to use this double write buffer uh, as data is committed as a all or nothing write. Uh, so we know that cloud vendors uh, today are already using this feature. Uh, it's based on known kernel and hardware behavior. Uh, so really the support we're proposing is kind of just to formalize what people are already doing in the field. Uh, so the important part is the user space API. So, uh, so first off, we're really focusing just on hard hardware offload support uh, for NVMe and SCSI. I'll just come to that a little bit later. Uh, one of the ask key aspects of the API is the introduction of the ORFW atomic flag uh, for PWrite v2 or we can support uh, IOCB atomic for AIO or IOU ring. Uh, so what this does is tells the kernel that we want the write to be issued with torn write protect protection, meaning that uh, any write uh, is committed all or nothing to the actual media. Uh, so just a point of interest is that you still need RFW sync or one of its friends to actually guarantee the persistence. So your atomic write syscall might return and it still might not be persisted unless you use RWF sync or one of the equivalents. Uh, so one of the other aspects of the API is that we can probe the limits of the actual uh, atomic writes for an I node uh, with static. Uh, so we've introduced uh, three new fields, uh, the atomic write uh, min unit, max unit, and also maximum segments. Uh, so the values are reported, they depend on the file system, the block layer limits, and actual storage device limits. Uh, but one thing, uh, key aspect is that the sizes would all, always be a power of two for the minimum max. Uh, so, and the rules that apply for the PWrite v2 using the RFW atomic are the total length of the write uh, must be between the minimum and the max, inclusive, and a power of two. It must be at a natural aligned offset, and the actual maximum number of segments you can use in your PRI v2 call must be equal to or less than the actual uh, uh, value in the atomic write segments max. Okay. So that was really introduced such that we can actually guarantee to user space that when they issue an atomic write that it can actually fit into a single bio and be sent down to the actual hardware device as a single request and submitted as a single actual transaction. Uh, just a oh, note on so, so, John, yeah, can you go back, have yeah. a question on the previous slide? Uh -huh. Before that one. All right. So the, I wasn't aware of that, but the RWF sync in friends are still required to guarantee persistence. So what if you issue your uh, atomic write, it goes to the device write cache, the drive starts flushing that, you okay. get an EPO before you get a chance to issue your sync? Again, it, the device will do it all or nothing. The difference is if you use RFW wow. sync. Okay, uh, good luck with an HDD on that one. But 
the point is if you have to use an RW sync or equivalent when the syscall returns to make, make sure it actually has been committed uh, to persistence. Okay. So you, you do require uh, hardware support for that, so the, the yeah. hardware has to, okay. Yeah. Thanks. And if you switch to the next slide. Right. Uh, no, yeah, that, no uh, that one. Buttons are small. Add a naturally aligned offset. What is naturally aligned? Uh, meaning that, uh, for example, an 8K write will be at an 8K on an 8K boundary. That's what naturally aligned means. Okay. Or 16K will be on a 16K boundary, at least. Okay. Uh, so just a couple of notes on SCSI and NVMe. These are, are technologies of interest. Uh, they sort of have a orthogonal feature sets. Uh, one of the key differences between NVMe and SCSI is that NVMe doesn't actually support a, uh, a dedicated command for an atomic write. Uh, writes will be issued atomically. Uh, uh, just a clarification there. Yeah. It's not that it doesn't support it. It doesn't need it. It's very different. Well, what, what did I say? You said that NVMe doesn't um, uh, support it. I said it doesn't have a dedicated command. Right. All, all writes in NVMe are basically atomic writes. In, in, implicitly atomic, but... Uh, as long as you obey, as long as you obey the advertised alignment rules. Yeah, so uh, NVMe has no dedicated command to issue a uh, write atomically. It's implicit, and it will be atomically executed when it follows, when it's less than the actual atomic write limit. Uh, the one we're interested in is an AWPF, which is the power fail atomic write limit. Uh, and it doesn't cross any atomic write boundary, if any exists. So uh, NVMe atomic write boundary is a per LBA space uh, boundary that, as I said, if a write crosses that boundary, it's uh, not atomic. Uh, some people have issue with this, that uh, they would like to know that the write was an atomic some people don't seem to. But anyway, so uh, for SCSI, there is a dedicated command, uh, write atomic 16. There's a other one called 32, which is related to uh, uh, protection information as well. So uh, uh, it has some extra constraints uh, compared to RMVME, like a minimum granularity or alignment. Some people say that they're the same thing, uh, depending on how you look at it. Uh, so SCSI does have a per IO boundary, uh, which means that IOs can be split uh, per uh, or atomically split uh, per I.O. Uh, we're not interested in using that in the, my proposed solution. And one of the good aspects, maybe people don't think it is, that an atomic write which exceeds the disk limits is actually rejected or errors. Okay. So uh, as I said, for, for NVMe, you wouldn't know. So uh, maybe, I don't know. Uh, just, OK, I'll, I won't take too much more time. Uh, so in terms of kernel implementation, uh, we were just focusing on direct I.O. because our database of interest is MySQL. Or, uh, but having said that, other people are interested in buffered I.O. And that's what we're going to discuss later. So uh, uh, we're working on XFS support and block device file operations. Some guys were working on EXT4, but I haven't heard much about that recently. So I don't know what the status is there. Uh, and then the block layer, sim simple principle is that uh, for an atomic write, we'll just submit a single bio ever, and we can't split it, uh, but we can merge. Uh, and then finally, for XFS support, uh, for atomic writes, uh, or we need a, a new feature called force align, which uh, is something that XFS doesn't have uh, already, which is to guarantee the extent alignment and granularity. So if you consider, if you want to write a uh, atomically two file system blocks, you need to make sure that they're contiguous uh, in, disk blocks, so uh, that's actually a lot of the work we're doing for the XFS support is supporting force align. Uh, um, John? Yeah. Sorry, can you go back? Yeah. Right. Um, does it make sense to have the BIOS merged? Sorry? Does it make sense to have the BIOS merged, the atomic rights? You can do, as long as it, it still can be executed atomically. It's not the question whether you can, it's the question whether it makes sense. Because well, the, the whole idea of the atomic one is that while well, the I/O has to be written, it has to be done atomically, which again there might be a chance that you can't, and the whole thing might fail. Yeah. Okay. So and um, if you now merge them, 
you suddenly have a bio which is partially failed. Okay. Because then you suddenly you have torn the bio, which is the precise the thing which you try to avoid here. Meaning you would need to somehow figure out, all right, yes, you can, tor you can tear it here, but not there, which is a horrible ABA no, to start okay, with. Okay, look, Should we just disallow it and be done with? Look, I've taught it this, believe me. Yeah. And uh, so, like, we won't merge them if they can't be executed atomically. It's simple as that. How would you know in advance that you can do it? Because we know what the device limits are. It's not a matter of the limits. You might just get a simple I.O. error. Well, then the whole, uh, the whole I.O. will be failed. Even that one which hasn't been submitted yet? Well, Well, yes, but that means that you end up with an I.O. error of, an I of the second merged one, which you haven't submitted yet, because you never, uh, but, which but, hasn't but, been But the I.O. error will be for the whole request, not just for one part of it. So, right, if you have two, uh, if you have two, uh, two atomic rights, which you merge together, uh -huh. and then you get a failure on that I.O., on yeah. the single I.O. Yeah. So you have to fail both of them. Yes. Because you cannot tear. Yes. And that is okay. Well, yes. Okay. Yeah, why not? <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> no. All right, good. Okay. Look, look, if that's not, no concern, okay, good. Look, look, the main thing is that you don't just commit ha half of it or partially. Uh, uh, okay, and then, uh, yeah, so I said for XFS support, uh, most of the work has actually been done on the force line feature to guarantee extent alignment. I think for EXT4, you can just use the big, yeah, in the big alloc. And then this is just a uh, snippet of how somebody could do that with uh, commands. So the idea is that we can actually set per inode to actual extent alignment. So we don't need to do it for the whole file system. We can just say for this particular inode, uh, we want to do 16K atomic rights and we can set the extent size. Uh, I, I said, for, uh, yeah, so the idea is that it's configurable per, per inode, so we can set a, for example, a 16K extent alignment requirement on an inode, so the, files, the whole file system does need to follow this uh, extent alignment, which is a good advantage. Uh, so, yeah, and then, okay, so the latest two patch sets, there's two outstanding. Uh, there's the core part, which has the block layer, VFS, and drivers, and then there's XFS support. So, uh, yeah, we're hoping to, to get a little bit more review on those from the maintainers and interested parties. And I also submitted a RFC for the buffered I.O. So, uh, Ted, if you want to just uh, talk about that. Yeah, so let me give a little bit more context, and I'll actually try to get to the new stuff. Um, so, first of all, uh, current status, uh, there are... Uh, cloud vendors that are providing first-party uh, uh, databases, typically using MySQL, that are doing it today. They are doing it using ext4 with the big alloc feature, um, where the cluster allocation size is set to 16K. MySQL uses direct I.O., which if you very carefully audit the code paths, and you know you are not using Device Mapper, um, and you know that the cloud emulated block device provides um, untorn write granula um, guarantees, uh, it's actually safe to do, but you know, lots of sharp edges, and you have to actually audit the code and pray that a future uh, you know, kernel update won't break your assumptions. But people are doing it today, and the reason why they are doing it today is depending on the workload, you can get anywhere between a 60 and a 100%. That's double your database performance. Um, so it's a big deal, people really care, and that's because you can avoid doing the double right, which means you significantly improve your performance. So this is something that people are doing today. Right, and I want to actually make that clear. And I also want to make clear that the only thing they care about is that rights, if they must be torn, can only be torn on a 16K boundary, right? That is the requirement. Now, one of the things that's been going on is we keep talking about atomic rights. And so people have been trying to provide stronger guarantees than what is strictly required by the database vendors. 
And if that's free, that's great. But if there is additional overhead required, so for example, some XFS developers were actually proposing, well, we could actually provide one megabyte atomic rights by um, basically doing, you know, a copy on writes where you write to newly allocated blocks and then you mess with the uh, file metadata to point at the new location, which is great, but now that means every single database update now requires a journaled file system metadata update, which would trash the performance, which like completely obviates the reasons why the database people wanted it in the first place. And so I do want to make clear that while we keep using the term atomic writes, the only thing people actually care about is untorn writes. And when you talk to the database people, the standard database size is 16K. And if you push them on it, they'll say, well, maybe someday we might go to 32K and like perhaps 64K like long in the future. But like they don't need anything bigger than that, right? Now they may also want to do like a contiguous 128K write if they're committing a large uh, transaction. If you force them to do, you know, eight separate system calls because we have to actually do it at the atomic write granularity or pwrite v2 will fail, they probably won't care that they're having to do extra system calls and maybe IO ring makes that go away anyway. But, you know, again, strictly speaking, you know, they may send a 256K write down. The only thing they care about is if there's an IO failure, they want to know about it, right? And if you must tear or you must fail, fail on the 16K boundary, right? And I just want to remind people, those are the requirements. If we want to do something more, that's great. Let's just not make it be more expensive. A yeah, question, uh, Ted. Yeah. Um, the performance numbers, can you reiterate that again and also so, uh, clarify if there any of this uh, performance uh, metrics are public or private? Uh, it's public. Uh, there was a Google I.O. presentation that I gave, I don't know, five, six years ago about this. Um, was that on what type of storage? A cloud, it was a cloud-based storage system. Uh, so, you know, GCE persistent disk, MySQL, um, and essentially, uh, in the perfect case, you can essentially double your uh, transaction throughput. In real world case, it's usually not quite that. Uh, just go back uh, a bit over 10 years ago, Fusion IO implemented Atomic IO and MySQL uh, for it, and they were doubling their performance because it avoided the write ahead logging. So we've known for somewhere in the order of 10, 12 years um, that atomic writes will double your performance for small I.O. Yep, yeah. Under name, I think it really comes from, uh, under name, it really comes from the hardware, yep. as in. Mm -hmm. That's what it's called for NVMe, that's what it's called for SCSI. Uh, yep. Just on the point you're saying that yep. uh, you don't want to torn on the 16K, or let's see, 16K boundary is where you want to be able to tear. And we're saying you can only submit 16K at a time. Don't forget, we're saying there's a range of writes you can do. Yeah, sorry, again. Uh, we're saying there's a range of writes you can do, so you don't have to do 16Ks. If they're aligned, you could do a 64 and a 16 or whatever. So it's, yeah, there's. With buffered IO, where that starts getting hard. Yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. what. Uh, we'll, we'll get there, but I think we're still in stage setting. Yeah, just just, just re-amplify Ted's point about that they care about the rights being torn at 16k boundaries. I, I I talked to these people before I specified NVMe, and this is why NVMe is specified the way it is because they want to do 128k rights, which are only torn at 16k boundaries and not at any other boundaries. So that's why NVMe has different behaviour from SCSI because we actually went and talked to software people first and then specified it. Yeah. Um, I, I, I have a somewhat unrelated question, which is, has anyone considered proposing to the SCSI people that they follow NVMe on this and actually provide useful semantics? Because my understanding is that nobody, there's, there's no real hardware that supports the atomic write operation today. It's all um, like, oh, my, my software-defined array supports this. It, it's not like I have a hard drive that supports this.
Uh, <laughs> well, the 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 the. the, the uh, uh, for. Well, okay, so, 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 um, how does SCSI handle, I, I, I want to do a 128K right, I don't care where it gets torn as long as it's sort of 16K boundary, because from what John was saying, that the, the, there is, uh, uh, there is a, SCSI does support a per, uh, per IO boundary, and it does allow splitting a right at those boundaries, it's just for this actual implementation that I've proposed, we're not using it. Oh, okay. So I, I, I thought I understood from your slides Sorry, that if, yeah, so. if, if you submitted, uh, well, let me see. Uh, yeah, that one. Yeah. That slide. It, I, yeah. I, I, I thought what you're saying, an atomic right which exceeds atomic disk atomic right limits is rejected. I assume that meant that a 128k right would be rejected. Okay. So uh, for our user space API, we're saying uh, you can do a 16k atomic right. Okay, and user space submits a 16k right with this flag and it goes down to the actual SCSI device and doesn't get split. It doesn't get torn at any boundary, okay? What, what we're saying is, or what I'm saying is that SCSI does support that, uh, a per IO uh, splitting boundary, but we're just not using it uh, because, we're not using it because uh, the user space API is such that we're only submitting uh, one atomic right at a time, that's why. Uh, so let, let me get to the buffered I.O. part, which is the part where this gets interesting, which is the interface that we've described using IOCB, Atomic, and PWrite V2 works great for direct I.O. because, in essence, right after you send the direct, what, right after user space sends the PWrite V2, very shortly thereafter, the SCSI command goes out. Um, with buffered I.O., you're going through the page cache. Right? And the write might not happen for 30 seconds or until user space calls uh, F data sync. Uh, and the reason why we care about this is because Postgres still uses buffered I.O. And depending on who you talk to, it is between three years and like six or seven years before they will be able to switch to direct I.O. Um, and once you include when enterprise customers are willing to trust that latest version of Postgres, extend those time frames accordingly. Um, so there is interest in doing this for buffered I.O. Um, specifically because of uh, Postgres. Um, now, the issue is if we, using the IOCB atomic interface, the presumption is that if you send a 64K write that we have to remember the fact that that 64K write is atomic. And if you send a 16K write, that that 16K write is atomic. And previously, there have also been assertions that we have to support hybrid mode, where if some other user space application, which is atomic write oblivious, that is writing to that same file using the standard write system call, that you know, on a completely unaligned basis, that things don't blow up, right? And so we started over-constraining the problem in various interesting ways um, because of the PWrite v2 interface, which was perfectly good for direct I.O., but it is a stronger guarantee than what the database people actually need, right? Now, there are multiple ways of fixing that. Um, a lot of them assume that you set for on a per inode basis what the required buffered granularity should be. Uh, and maybe you do that based on the XFS force align extent size. Um, maybe you do that via some new uh, FN, uh, IO, IOCTAL or FNCOTL, you know, there are different ways that you do that. Um, but then the question is, do we stick with the PWrite v2 interface? And if we do, do we do things like say, well, because we don't want to track whether we promised a 16K or a 32K or 128K uh, atomicity guarantee, um, we force the buffered I.O. program to only do IOCB atomic rights at the 16K granularity, and therefore we don't have to keep track of all of that. I've seen other um, proposals which is, 
You actually influence what folio size you use because these tend to be power of two aligned. Um, so depending on whether you do a 16K or a 32K write, you use a folio of that size. And that works great until you have overlapping dirty pages in the folios um, and life starts getting complicated again. Um, and a lot of this is because the PWrite v2 interface is in fact a lot more powerful than what is strictly speaking necessary for the database. Um, and like there are lots of different use cases. Some of them have different implications about what you have to do at the MM layer and what the user space has to do. Um, I don't think any of them are terribly wrong, but we have to decide and they all have different you know, uh, efficiency trade-offs and complexity trade-offs. Uh, and that's sort of the short version of the problem statement. Um, and I think there are questions that maybe we should take those. So I kind of got stuck at the beginning when you said buffered I.O. because you said one of the requirements is, is that we find out that there's an error when there's a write. And I would think with buffered I.O. that you would not know at the time. Well, F data sync, right? That's how, that's how it works today, right? Which is when you call F data sync, you wait for the F data sync to return and user space oh. checks the error return okay. from the F data sync. Um, and they know whether or not there was an I.O. error. So it's buffered in name only, basically. Well, no, it is, it is complete. This is exactly how buffered I.O. works today without any kind of untorn rights um, guarantees, right? You do a whole okay. bunch of buffered rights, then you call F sync or F okay. data sync, and depending on, you know, the write may not return an error, but the F data sync will. Got it. Okay. Right? That's, we basically, this is what, Postgres does today, they understand that that's the documented POSIX interface. Yeah, so, so probably two points. So one, uh, one point is if we are going to have like these different atomic IO sizes, that, then one thing we could do is like flush out all the dirty data in the buffer cache whenever we detect basically new system call with different granularity of the atomic yep. IO, yeah, which we don't expect like to happen for sensibly behaved applications. So, so the perf it will work like functionally and we don't care, we could define, we don't care about the overhead. Uh, so that would be one way to approach like different granularities requested for the or different granularities of atomic IO2 happening to the same file. Uh, and other point is yes, seeing that, you know, this all kind of hinges also on the file system doing the allocations properly aligned and given that there we anyway have this basically force align option and we specify like particular granularity there for the alignment, then I don't quite see the advantage of like, you know, how this would work. You know, like given that the allocation is anyway con constrained to a particular size, like say 32K or whatever, then it's not going to work with like you submitting 64K atomic right anyway. Yeah? So uh, then like, yeah. Yeah, but, but I, I, I think uh, like, uh, you know. Can, if I just, if you don't mind, I, I sent an RFC. If I just quickly describe what, what it does, would that, Maybe that's a, and then we yeah. can come back to it. Yeah, I, I mean, like if we have if we have the fixed granularity set in the allocation for the I node, basically for the alloc block allocation anyway, then why not have the granularity set also for basically all the IOs or like somehow for the writes happening to the I node? Yeah, like basically having fixed granularity set for the I node and all the writes happening with the flag set will use this granularity, yeah, or something like this. Uh, well, yeah, well, for the RFC I sent, uh, this uh, granularity is based on the four slide extent size. Mm -hmm. I, I think any file system can set it how it likes. It just needs to report the value uh, back uh, in the statx call for the actual size that it supports. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if, okay. Um, so I actually have in my gigantic patch set 
or development tree real-time reflink support for XFS in which I kind of need a similar thing of being able to dirty, you dirty a byte, but you actually need to dirty a whole bunch of stuff in order to write, to do copy on write on allocation unit extent, allocation unit granularity. Regrettably, because it's XFS, that means we have to support 28K block size, which is why I keep asking for that. But it would be very helpful to have a better way of marking the entire range dirty and then making sure that the right, that right pages actually grabs the entire set and sends it all out as a single I.O. So we might end up there anyway. But what I actually wanted to ask is, remind me, the SCSI and NVMe commands, they synchronize untorn writes with all the other reads, correct? Yes. Uh, so SCSI has something different in NVMe. So uh, Yay. Uh, SCSI has two modes of dealing with uh, racing reads and writes, mm -hmm. so. So, question I had is for the block, for the block layer changes, I've noticed a few times that we don't really do much with Rec Atomic, and, I th and it occurred to me, because Kent prompted me earlier, do we actually need to have Rec Atomic do something for atomic reads where we then turn off splitting BIOS, because if you send multiple SCSI commands on behalf of one larger request from further up the stack, then you could actually end up with torn writes because we issued this read, then this untorn write came in, and then another, and then the second half of the read got dispatched to the device, and now you actually are getting, you know, stale data and fresh data. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, SCSI, as I said, there's two modes. Okay, so one is that if you have a racing uh, non-atomic read and write, uh, the actual device should synchronize them, so uh, it will. Mm -hmm. uh, any ongoing reads and writes will be executed first, and then the atomic write will overwrite what was ever written there before. Uh, or there's another mode where if you have ongoing reads and writes uh, and you issue an atomic write, uh, then the ongoing reads and writes will be failed, errored. Hmm. Okay. So essentially, it's seen as a user space. Application think. bug really to have racing reads and writes like this. Mm -hmm. I'll have to think Are about we, that some more. So, with the buffered writes, uh, Ted seems to be suggesting that we have some kind of page flag or folio flag that indicates that it's atomic, whatnot. With the forced aligned uh, flags that we're using with, with XFS, we don't actually need the page cache to do anything in particular special. Um, the fact is, is that uh, at the IOMAP layer, we know about the atomic read and write layers, so we can do read around at that point on any read IO for short uh, reads, and we can do the same thing for short writes as well. Uh, and that means that when it comes to write back, all that we need to do is align the write back I.O. to the actual underlying device hardware. It's the same as the bio merge question. As long as the I.O.s that we build are within the constraints of the atomic I.O., it doesn't matter where the boundaries really are. Um, yeah, the, the important thing is when you do the write back is that when you submit the bio to the block layer, you have to say this is an atomic one, you have to submit it all or nothing. That's the right. important part. So, uh, I mean, effectively, uh, you know, the, there's a, you know, we can decouple the incoming rights from the outgoing rights. There is an issue where, uh, you know, of course, there's always corner cases where, you know, if you, if you do a 128K write, you can't actually merge that up to 256K. The incoming atomic rights have to be correctly aligned so that the outgoing atomic rights will be correctly aligned. Um, yeah, so I think the issue is uh, for SCSI, because there are two different commands for atomic and non-atomic rights, you need to have some kind, you either have to say, okay, if we have a file system that has force align, we always use the atomic write well, command if it's, yeah. uh, if it's supported, or you want to have some sort of flag on a per folio or per inode basis saying for writes associated with the folio or the inode, use the atomic write command because presumably 
the atomic write command is more expensive than the non-atomic variant, so you only want to use it when it's needed. Uh, understood, but we already have that for XFS. Part of the atomic writes uh, setup is that the inode is tagged that will do atomic writes on that inode. So we already have that per inode flag to say that IO will be done via atomic writes. So well, uh, well, that just means it supports atomic writes. It doesn't mean we always do atomic writes. Well, I think what Dave is no, suggesting no, is that for XFS, if the force align flag is set on that inode, all rights to that inode mm, use... Not the force align. There's a second flag that says atomic rights. There's ah, two okay. on-disk flags. One for force alignment because there's a case for, yeah, use case for that. Okay. Um, for DAX, for PMD mm -hmm. alignment, things like that, um, and various other use cases. But for actually enabling atomic rights, there's another flag to say the direct I.O. code will now set um, atomic rights. We'll use the same thing for buffered rights. Yeah, the uh, other aspect here is that we can get around all of these issues with doing atomic rights through the page cache simply by doing right through in the page cache. Rather than write back, as we currently do now, if we do write through, it then becomes the same model as direct I.O. Uh, uh, okay, so, so, so... Pardon? It's, it, I, I would suggest that we'd implement it with the direct I.O. code, just passing it pages from the page cache. Oh, okay, just, just, yeah. uh, okay, so I'll just describe my RFC, okay? Yeah. So, uh, so... As we've mentioned, it's pretty hard to maintain all the different sizes of overlapping atomic rights. So uh, for the RFC, the static min and max will just report the uh, extent size. Uh, so we just allow one size for buffered I.O. So, and that size is used to set the folio uh, order. Mm -hmm. Okay? So then... Uh, so when user space issues a, uh, an atomic write, that folio, in, in how it implemented in my way I did it was, the folio uh, is set with a atomic page flag. And how that's used is once you actually do the write back, that's checked and if it's set, this atomic page flag, then it issues a bio, which is a, has the rec atomic flag set. The, the, the tricky part is how to handle the if someone starts doing non-atomic rights with atomic rights on the same folio. And as realistically, I don't think we care in that case because yeah, applications you, won't you be doing You could say it's a uh, user space we're, bug to start doing that. We're talking about this being for performance, not for any other reason. And so if an application is mixing non-atomic and atomic rights to the same file, they're still having to do all of the force alignment stuff. They're still having to do all of that sort of thing it doesn't make any sense to add extra overhead and extra tracking when we're just going to be doing the, you know, the forced alignment and yeah, atomic yes, rights uh, in the back end anyway. Yeah, like it, it, it doesn't sound like it makes any sense to actually doing the mixed atomic and non-atomic, mm -hmm. but how you could handle it is one, you could say, oh, the folio still maintains the atomic and you still write it back atomically, or it just loses it because some has been doing some dodgy stuff in user space and don't write it back atomically. Well, we're not doing that with direct I.O. Direct I.O. is determining what it's going to do based on the inode flag, whether it's got uh, atomic rights set on it. Sure. What makes buffered I.O. different? Well, no, on XFS, the inode flag yeah. just says whether it supports atomic rights. It doesn't say whether uh, every right is translated to do be executed yeah. atomically. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I think it's also fairly simple whether you are checking the... A persistent atomic I.O. flag that XFS has, or you just simply have a uh, in-memory inode flag, which is there has been at least one atomic write made to this inode, you know, and wh while that is set, you basically play the atomic I.O. game, um, and if that inode ever gets dropped out of the cache, then you um, drop the bit Right? I mean, that's another implementation scheme yeah. that doesn't require allocating yeah, uh, a uh, yeah. persistent so once bit. Once it gets written back, then it doesn't yeah. need to be atomic. The, the yeah. whole point is that yeah. the write back is the atomic parse. Exactly, right. Yeah. And so you could just simply say, if you've done an atomic write, you set it in memory bit. Yeah. And then the only, you know, 
the only time we actually will drop the inode from the inode cache is when the page cache has been completely dropped, mm -hmm. and therefore all of the write back has happened, sure. right? So yeah. there are multiple ways of skinning that particular cat. I think the question is, do we error um, if the user does a hybrid mix of atomic versus non-atomic writes, oh. and do you error if people, you know, s you know, send a pwrite v2 with a size that is, you know, yeah. not exactly the atomic write granularity, right? It's always well, been you know, in these you have details. To error that, but yeah. whether they start mixing them, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Like, who really cares if they start doing things like this? Then they seem to be doing something wrong anyway. So, <laughs> so. yeah. <laughs> Whatever is easiest for us, I say. Yeah. <laughs> We just need to define very clearly what the semantics are, right? Yeah, so, so one thing still isn't 100% clear to me. So, you know, so we have this database which presumably wants like 16K, 16K atomicity, at like Antorn writes. Now, uh, it also wants to submit, say, 128K writes. Yeah? That, that's basically the requirement from the database. And it wants to submit like 120K, 128K write which is untorn or torn only on 16K boundary. Now, with this API, with pwrite, this would presumably need modification of the databases because it would assume that the 128K write will require to be completely atomic. Well, I'm not sure what you mean by it. Sorry? The database. The database doesn't support this today, and it just needs to know that it can only support one size of atomic uh, for the page cache. That's it, or for a buffered IO. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, uh, okay. So you said, oh, the, the database would need to uh, be changed to support oh, uh, yeah. this, but like the database, but, the but, database today doesn't support this at all. So uh, it needs to be changed anyway, and it just needs to know for a buffered IO it. There's only one size supported for uh, atomic rights. Yeah, but, but you imagine basically that the database would be changed to split these 128k writes into smaller ones yeah, based sure. on the granularity. Yeah, yeah and sure. I've, I've like talked it's, it's to Postgres develop, uh, a Postgres developer who's on their mm -hmm. core team or whatever, um, and they have expressed to me, or at least this person has expressed to me, that even if they are making a change to a two-year-old version of Postgres, which they will need to do because customers don't yep. upgrade to the latest version of Postgres every year, um, changing it to use pwrite v2 is a relatively minor change. They are willing okay. to do that. And if they need to take 128K um, uh, write and split it into 16 or 32K pwrite v2s, they are willing to hack that in because it's in a relatively small and well-controlled portion of the Postgres code. So they're willing to do that um, if that's what we tell them they have to do. Okay. I, I don't think we need to be concerned about the, 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 the legacy upgrade story because while Postgres customers are very fond of running ancient databases, those ancient databases are running on Neolithic kernels. So it, it's, it's just not something we need to be concerned about. Actually, um, they, the reason why they care is because these are first party um, uh, cloud database services. So the kernel is actually under uh, uh, the cloud provider's control. It's just that um, the database people aren't quite as rigorous as the kernel is about no semantic changes between major versions. And so the customer wants to stay on a two-year-old version of the database, but we can, in fact, put a modern kernel on the sucker. 